is getting awfully feisty, but uh, I have a cure for that now because I'm going to present to you Pete Dolak, who is a good man to have behind you in a dark alley because he knows people. <laughs> thing. Pete gets around, a native of New Jersey who now lives in Brooklyn. Um, his poetry tends to fall into two categories, the political and the silly. All right, Pete, what's the other category? <laughs> The silly and the political. Oh, all right. Um, and where possible, tries to combine the two. Oh, those were the two categories. All right. Under the theory that there is no reason not to have a sense of humor just because you have a point of view. Well, look what happened to Adlai Stevenson. Twice. <laughs> well, this Ancient is going, history. This is going, you'd be surprised. Uh, let's see. He's performed at countless venues, including the New Yorkian Poets Cafe. Uh, where they didn't elect him, <laughs> the Knitting Factory, the Orange Bear, and the University of the Streets. Let's see, you're working on a book, and now a word from our sponsors. And, you, indeed, yes. Have you found the sponsor for the book? Uh, I yes. mean, a publisser. I mean. Uh, yes, I, I, I do have a publisher. In fact, it's one of these, uh, uh, one of the kind of things that's worth the wait because uh, why it's been about a year in, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the making, my, my publisher has had a, a, a series of, of delays, shall we say, but hopefully by this, <laughs> by this September, we're very optimistic that uh, it will finally see print. That, that'll be my ah. first collection in print. Is your publisher politically motivated? Uh, not, not to the best of my knowledge. Uh huh. All right, we're going to give Pete a chance here to save the world, so take it away. All right. This is Give Me Disney or Give Me Death. <laughs> I was just flipping through the channels. Why was Ted Koppel wearing mouse ears? There had to be some explanation, so I turned up the sound. He was talking about President for Life Michael Eisner. We have our solemn duty, Ted Koppel said. Be happy or else. Then he declared it was time for a live report from our nation's capital, Orlando, Florida. Well, I thought I've obviously missed something. And on the screen, a man was being dragged away by police, the crowd screaming for no mercy to be shown. The on-scene reporter solemnly looked into the camera, quivering with righteous anger, yet every hair had a $700 haircut perfectly in place, emoting just the way he was taught. Yes, it's true, he told his audience in a hushed whisper. That man insulted Mickey Mouse, but don't worry, he'll get what he deserves. Back to you, Ted. I quickly changed the channel, but there was a colonel who warned me, turn back to ABC now, and Ted Koppel was awed, transfixed like a corporate takeover artist meeting Ronald Reagan or someone brain dead meeting Dan Quayle. Koppel was introducing a new president for life. He was wearing a Donald Duck tie. His eyes bore into me from the screen like two lasers locked onto the targets. Before he spoke, the cameras panned the audience, all set up at full attention. Soldiers hovered at the back, armed with AK-47s. The uniforms had locos. Mickey's militia. Then the screen flashed back to President for Life Eisner. This is what you wanted, he said. We did this for your own good. From now on, there will be order. The police will be by later tonight. All citizens will have their Mickey Mouse posters on the wall, or you will be an enemy of the state. All citizens will have their goofy watches synchronized so you won't be late, late for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, or you will be an enemy of the state. All citizens will have made their mandatory pilgrimages from the Disney store. The police will be checking, don't be an enemy of the state. All citizens will have filed complete itineraries detailing when you will make your mandatory pilgrimage to Orlando, or you will become an enemy of the state. The screen went blank, and then I knew. The whole land, a giant theme park, be happy. Enjoy the show, or else. Well, in the uh, words of the immortal Shakespeare, oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Well, Shakespeare was a fine man. <laughs> I don't think he meant it in quite that tone. Yeah. But <laughs> so, how often have you been an, an enemy of the state, Pete? <laughs> uh, more times than I probably should confess, being this is going to be publicly seen. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you want more, I'm sure you can file a Freedom of Information Act, and they'll probably send you a little bit of information on me, I'm sure. Well, it's not free anymore, but if you send 995 to Interpol. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> well, that's what you told me you did to, to check up on me beforehand. Yeah. Robert yeah. believes in being very thorough, you know. They, they charged me that kind of money, too. I hope they don't find out that the check bounced. It's going to be very <laughs> embarrassing for us all. <laughs> um, 
Do you always write like that? Uh, often I do. You know, I, as I say, I, not not all of my stuff is, is political, but much of it is. It just seems to be uh, what comes out naturally. You know, one, one thing I find is, is, is as artists, many times we all seem to return to the same theme. And, and hopefully we just have many different ways of, of, of writing about the same theme. Unfortunately, I've yet to write out, run out of ways of saying the same thing. Hopefully this will last for a while. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have to think of something else to say. Well, the first time I heard that piece, I was inspired to wear my mouse ears backwards, and nobody noticed. Oh, well, uh, I guess the younger generation has not grown up on the Mickey Mouse Club as you and I did, people of our generation. <laughs> yes, I, I, see. I was always interested in, uh, in getting Annette alone in the cartoon vault. Anyway. <laughs> but that's a whole other story. Perhaps another Perhaps another tale. <laughs> Perhaps indeed. All right, and this, this in fact, uh, we, uh, of the aforementioned forthcoming uh, first, first volume, uh, uh -huh. and now a word from our sponsors. Ah. Uh -huh. Space, the final frontier, which you can enjoy in just a few minutes as soon as our McDonald's liftoff is complete. You can remove your seatbelts when the Golden Arches sign is turned off. We hope your trip from Cape Coca-Cola will be enjoyable and safe. Now, if you all look out the right side windows, you can see the neon orbiting Budweiser sign. Enjoy it while you can. The sign's orbit is already beginning to decay and will plummet to Earth in a fiery crash. But don't worry, Anheuser-Busch will be launching a new sign even bigger than this one. It'll be so bright you won't be able to see the stars during the four hours it will take to cross the sky. But won't it be worth it to see Budweiser blazing across the night sky? Now, if you look a bit further to your right, that bright red object you see is the Lockheed Martin Planet Mars. It sure is fitting a defense contractor is able to put its name on a planet named for the god of war. Fortunately, the planet didn't sustain too much damage when Boeing and Lockheed Martin went to war over the naming rights. In fact, Mars will look better than ever once the terraforming project is finished. Lockheed's Martin's name will cover the entire planet from 45 degrees north to 45 degrees south. Then every time you see the planet through your telescope, instead of seeing all those boring reds and greens, you'll see a beautiful, full-color company logo. Now, if you look toward your left, down at the Earth, you should be able to see the Exxon Pacific Ocean. Isn't it wonderful how company engineers were able to arrange their oil rigs to spell out Exxon? They say the Exxon sign is almost 3,000 miles across. To think those silly environmentalists complained. We should all be proud to pay our 10% tax surcharge for it. Now, in a few more minutes, North America will rotate into view. We'll have plenty of time to see the General Motors sign where North Dakota and South Dakota used to be. The sign is at its best at night when the blinking lights are on. They say you can see the sign all the way out to the asteroid belt. Enjoy your sightseeing, passengers, but don't forget to take your seats and buckle up when you see the flashing Pepsi holograph. That will mean it's time for the Pepsi landing. <laughs> By the way, you want to have your binoculars handy then. The General Mills Space Station will be orbiting into view. The half-mile-long Wheaties box is a sight not to be missed. When we land, we hope you'll enjoy your stay on the Microsoft moon. The Apollo 11 reenactment is held twice a day. You'll get goosebumps when you hear the holograph of Neil Armstrong say, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for Windows 95. If you need to ask for directions after landing, please don't forget the region where Apollo 11 landed is no longer called the Sea of Tranquility. It's now known as the Sea of Bill Gates. <laughs> of course, before you can sightsee, you'll need to clear customs. Please be sure to be wearing your advertising according to regulations and have your documentation from General Electric ready. No contact with direct sunlight is permitted without advanced payment of royalties to GE, which now owns Sunrise. You'll never forget your stay in the Microsoft moon. Who could even imagine what it would be like without advertising? I certainly can't. Well, maybe they'll, they'll all chip in and send us money for all these uh, shameless plugs that you do. <laughs> right. I, I'm trying to work on the corporate sponsorship action, but somehow they don't, <laughs> these companies don't seem to want to sponsor me for this. I, I can't understand why. I can't, I can't imagine why. Speaking of plugs, I just want to mention again that we're in the Dono Divino, which is a, a wonderful Italian <laughs> restaurant on 9th Avenue at 51st Street. We're grateful to Faye and the gang for letting us come in ah, and film. Now and you tell film. one. <laughs> All right, I have one more, one more plug here. You know, I, I specialize in, in, in long stuff here. This is my one short piece. This is spot, uh, 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 was uh, uh, inspired by the security guards who were posted on the street by, uh, down, down on Wall Street in the financial mm -hmm. district. I call this Inside Out on Wall Street. Mm. 
Standing tall, wearing cocky, looking like they're on safari, watching over the crowd streaming down Wall Street, private guards on public streets, ready to stop crime. But why are they on the streets of the financial district when all the crime is taking place inside? Oh, loaded question. Um, where was I? You've inspired me to do one of my own, by the oh, way. Oh, really? <laughs> Um, and since we're talking about corporate and all that, uh, I'd like to uh, tease Hal Surowitz and do something in his style. Um, all in a day's work. My boss said, always keep your cubicle neat and clean so that if you get hit by a truck and you go to the emergency room where the surgeon discovers that you don't wear clean underwear, we can still figure out what projects you were working on and how far along you were and whether you loused them up beyond all human comprehension. Besides, if your cubicle is neat and clean, it will be worth more when we rent it out to some temp who will be coming in to finish your work for you. We like the idea of somebody actually paying us for the privilege of working for us instead of us paying you three times what you are actually worth. If you die on the operating table, we will even go so far as to put up a plaque made of the finest plastic that money can buy commemorating your presence here. Something along the lines of George Washington slept here, but we will put your name on it and not George's because it seems to us that sleeping was your primary function as well. Besides, it won't cost us a cent because it will be paid for by our profit share cropping plan. Now get back to work before we name you employee of the month again. Ah, it reminds me of my day at my last job, which was on, on, on Wall Street, where you know, I was under deep cover. Come to, come to think of it, it does sound like one of yours, now that I think about it. Do you have any unfulfilled ambitions in this poetry racket? Well, uh, other than to, you know, uh, you know, be a world dictator, uh, not, not, not really. I, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to look, look, look big. Uh -huh. Trying to look big yeah, there, in which, big, which case cool. we will That's put poets in, in, in all cabinet positions there, and, yeah. and we'll, we'll, Wait, have, we'll I, have poets run the world. It'll be completely different and something new. I don't know. I've heard a mutual friend of ours say that, and somehow from so a lot of the poets I know um, and the way the government is, they might already be there. <laughs> which is which is no scary. things can get more screwed up than they are. All right, what kind of a job would you give me? <laughs> uh, let's see, minister of uh, well, you have a car. We make you minister of transportation. You just want a free ride. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what we have subways for. <laughs> All right, fess up, Pete. Have you ever written a love poem? Uh, I have to confess I don't. I once told my, my uh, last girlfriend that she must have been very upset with me. Here she's dating a poet, and she's <laughs> dating the only poet who doesn't write love poems. Maybe uh, someday, maybe someday, if uh, I'm ever inspired. What kind of job would we give Padma over here? Well, Padma? Oh, we make her foreign minister. She has, ex <laughs> she, you know, she's multilingual. I mean, I have enough trouble with English, and you know, she's got four or five languages. I'm, I'm always fascinated by people who are multilingual. I often ask them, you know, what you know all these languages. What, what language do you think in? Me? Yeah, my but language? what language do you think in? <laughs> <laughs> well, I speak Marathi, it's my mother tongue. In your mind? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder what she's thinking about us right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's, let's form the party now. What are we going to call it? before we fade out altogether? Uh, well, the poet's party. I, I, I think we should be upfront in, in what, our, what our aims are. And you know, it's a little alliteration there. People remember it, you know, the two Ps, double P for short. Mm, no, I don't think I care for those initials very much. <laughs> we'll have to think of something else. Uh, any advice for some of the aspiring poets? Uh, right. Right, and get out on the right. circuit. That's what I find. In, in all honesty, I find being on the circuit is a very good uh, uh, way of uh, Imposing discipline on me. You just don't want to go up there with some mediocre schlock. People are you expecting no. no. Well, <laughs> where, I know many. Where have many, I been the past right. Well, 10 many, years many other people do, of course. I can only speak for myself, but I find that's that's the way it goes here. You go up there, and people expect a certain level of work mm -hmm. out of you, and and so this, you think about this and sweat over this stuff when you're at your computer process. So that's. In all seriousness, that's what my recommendation would okay. be. Write and get out there and read it to people. See how it works. Great, Pete. Now, this is for everybody. Uh, go to Pete's readings, and when you see his name on the ballot, pull the lever for him. In fact, pull it several times. He needs all the help he can get. And with that, I want to Both thank Pete and Dolak and Padma Chakranarayan for coming on Poet the Poet, and we will see you soon.